going beyond the headlines. Asking the questions you want answered. Exploring government policies and how they impact you. We are delving deeper. Good evening, I'm Kimberly D'Souza and welcome to Delving Deeper, a series where we chat with cabinet members and ministry officials about what's taking place in their respective ministries and its impact on you. We ask the questions you want answered. Joining us this evening is the Minister of Public Utilities, Mr. Marvin Gonzalez. Minister, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Kimberly, and thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Now, Minister, you've been very vocal about the Water and Sewerage Authority, WASA, and its inability to supply water to customers. As of now, what percentage of the population is getting a 24-7 supply of water or at least a 24-4 supply of water? So the latest data that we have is that approximately 40% of the population enjoys a 24-7 water supply. As it relates to the, the customers that have over 24-4 water supply up to 24-7, the latest data indicates that over 64% or approximately 64% of the population enjoys uh, a water supply, a water schedule of 24-4 to 24-7. Minister, in terms of the dry season water plan, how will that affect the 24-7 or the 24-4 water supply currently given to customers? It does impact the, the water schedules across Trinidad and Tobago, especially those communities that enjoy 24-7, 24-5, 24-6. A number of those communities, they are located in areas where the main supply of water is from surface water sources like our rivers and our reservoirs, etc. So, for example, in East Trinidad, most of the plants located in East Trinidad, they depend on surface water sources. So for during the dry season, when you have less rainfall taking place in your rainforest and your catchment areas, the plants, they produce water below their design capacity. And by so doing, you have to redistribute the water from your ground sources to make up the shortfall in those areas. So what normally would happen is that communities that enjoy a 24-4, 24-5, or 24-7, you reduce that level of service so as to allow the utility company to re redistribute that water supply to some of the, the, the communities that are most impacted by seasonal conditions like, like our dry season. Now, Minister, the Community Water Improvement Program, it was launched last year, September. I mean, what has the response been like, especially for those residents who haven't received water in, let's say, 15 to 20 years? This program so far has been a tremendous success for the Ministry of Public Utilities and the Water and Sewerage Authority. It is a program that is funded under the PSIP of the Government um, Plan for Development in Trinidad and Tobago. And so far, we have successfully completed over 30 projects across the island, both islands, Trinidad and Tobago, impacting the, the water supply of approximately 100,000 citizens across the country. In a number of those communities, they have been integrated under WASA's um, distribution grid for the very first time. So we've traveled to Guayco, we've traveled to Ramjatan Trace, we've traveled to areas in Maruga, and some of those communities have never been integrated into WASA's distribution system. So out of that 100,000 citizens that benefited from CWIP, not only have those communities seen a drastic improvement in their water supply, that thousands of those communities and thousands of homes for the very first time are getting water for the very first time. And um, those citizens are very, you know, the joy that they express, the excitement that they've expressed, the communities that also participated in the execution of these projects, you know, they, they feel a, a sense of personal responsibility because what we have done under the Seaway program is to employ people within those communities to be part of the projects. So, so that even after the projects are successfully completed, the residents, the community, they take part and they participate in the maintenance of the plants and maintaining of the, the infrastructure, the new intake, because they now understand and they more appreciate the value and the investment and the positive impact it is having 
on their livelihood. So CWIP has been a tremendous success. So at the end of May, the Ministry of Public Utilities collaborating with WASA, we are going to launch the third phase of the Community Water Improvement Program. And we're expecting to positively impact the lives of approximately 25,000 more citizens, bringing approximately 130,000 citizens to be positively impacted by the successful execution of CWIP projects across both islands in Tobago and in Trinidad. Now, Minister, in terms of the Community Water Improvement Program, I mean, what is the next phase of the project? So, in the first phase, what we have done is that we journeyed to, to communities where the state of Wasser's infrastructure is very poor and where that community level of service is below 24-2. And, and that is the target. The main purpose is to make short-term interventions and identifying communities that get a, a, a water supply that is below 24-2, thereby bringing that, their, their level of service closer to 24-4 or 24-5. In many instances, a number of those communities get 24-7 water given the impact. So it not only entails the rehabilitation of their infrastructure, the replacement of aging pipelines, but the reintroduction of new pipelines in those communities. And for example, communities like, like La Pastora, Lopino, Guayco, there are a number of rivers in Aripo, in, um, in Lalaha, in, in East Trinidad. A number of those communities have rich, clean water from their rivers and their springs. And we've converted those rivers and springs into rural intake, thereby supplying that water supply coming from that rural intake in that community bringing thousands of gallons of water into Wasser's grid to redistribute into the community where that river and that pond or that spring is located. So for example, in Lopino, very soon we will be commissioning a new water treatment facility in the Lopino community. And we're expecting that after 45 years, a new water treatment facility constructed from a spring and a rich river source in that community, they will now move from a 24-3 water supply to a 24-7 water supply. Now, Minister, I must say, it seems as if the seaway program is reaching a lot of customers. But I know that one of the things we often hear is that there could be some sort of geographical discrimination in terms of the water distribution. Can you share some more about this? Um, as Minister of Public Utilities, it, it pains me a lot to hear people who ought to be more responsible in terms of their language and the, word that, the words that they use to come out in public and claim political, geographical, or racial discrimination. So I've traveled to communities in North Trinidad, in East Trinidad, in Central Trinidad, South, Southeast, Southwest, Tobago, and a number of those communities, we can do better with our water supply. I don't see geographical discrimination. So I will not be distracted by talk of geographical discrimination. I will keep focus on the work that I, I have before me. It is a very daunting task. I'm encouraged by the rewards that I've seen so far in the way in which the CWIP have imp has impacted on so many communities across Trinidad and Tobago. So I'll keep my focus there. And you see those communities that get water or water supply that is 24-2 and below, my focus over the next five or six months to improve the water supply, get additional water resources, deploy new modern water infrastructure to bring those communities up to the, to the level to enjoy a good water supply, perhaps closer to 24-5, 24-6, and in many instances, 24-7. And I don't see race, I don't see geography, I don't see locality, I don't see political affiliation, and therefore persons who have access to the media and have access to a microphone, I would encourage them to be more responsible in their public utterances. Now, Minister, we've heard about the suspension of the acting CEO of WASA, Mr. Shillan Shepard. Can you share some details on his suspension? Well, I think the Water and Sewage Authority and the Board of Commissioners, they, they issued a statement, and, which was a very factual, uh, truthful statement. It was a matter that arose between the CEO and the Board on a matter the board gave certain instructions to be followed and um, the board was not satisfied that those instructions were comprehensively followed 
um, it resulted in an investigation that was conducted by the head of the HR committee of the Board of Commissioners. And um, following the outcome of that investigation, the, a recommendation was made for the suspension of the acting CEO for one month without pay, and that is where we are. Um, I was advised, and based on the report that was provided to me as an attorney at law, I believed that due process was followed. The acting CEO was provided with adequate notice and, um, and an opportunity to respond to the allegations made against him. And, um, and I believe that the outcome of the matter, though unfortunate, is justifiable in the circumstances. Now, Minister, you would have mentioned the allegations that led to the acting CEO being suspended. Can you share some more details about these allegations? Well, um, I prefer not to really go into much details, but um, you know, based on the amount of speculations and the, the amount of misinformation that we have in the society, perhaps this is a good opportunity for me to clarify and to be very straight with the population so as to um, negate the possibility of further information, misinformation going into the national community. Um, the board had approved a list of customers who were owing WASA um, huge sums of money. And um, that list comprised of 30 customers. Um, they, those names were supposed to be published in the media. And um, I'm told that two of those names were removed before they were published in the media. And that resulted in the investigation. And the outcome of the investigation, the board was of the view that the CEO was responsible for the removal of those two names. Now, Minister, you were tasked with meeting union leaders to find a way forward on the many issues at WASA. Has this been done? Can you provide an update on the latest with this development? Um, I had two successful meetings, one with the NUGFW and the other meeting which took place uh, about two weeks ago with the Public Services Association. The president and members of the executive and the members representing the WASA section of the, the, the union. The, the both meetings, in my view, were very successful where the state of the authority was comprehensively discussed on the MPU side. Um, I leading a team of senior officials of the Ministry of Public Utilities and WASA and the union leaders, um, they, they led their team. We looked at all aspects of WASA's operation. The, 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 the state of its plans, the, the financial state of WASA, its relationship with its customers, leaks, etc. And I think the outcome of it, we, we agree that where we are as a country and the Water and Sewage Authority, we cannot continue if we were to provide the people of Trinidad and Tobago with a sustainable and a reliable water supply. So they agree that they will support the transformation and the restructuring of WASA. They, however, asked that in the government's making a decision for the restructuring of WASA, that the interests of the workers of both unions, the NUGFW and the PSA, that the interests of the workers ought to be taken into consideration, should be placed on high priority, but that they will support the government's thrust to transform the Water and Sewerage Authority. So I'm very grateful for that. It was not an acrimonious meeting. And, um, and you know, there are some parts we had disagreements, but those disagreements were very respectable. And, um, I'm, and I must say that I enjoy the engagement with both of the, the unions. Now, Minister, at the meeting, um, did any details about the employees' benefits come up? So, for example, voluntary separation packages or pensions? So, I don't want to prejudice the, um, or to divulge, you know, what transpired in the meetings, but um, there is a preference for voluntary separation of employment, I think, by both unions, and, and they've asked that should we um, move in the direction of reducing um, staff expenses on the authority that we give due consideration and high consideration for voluntary separation of employment, among other issues. Right. Now, Minister, business within both public and private sectors are owing state agencies such as WASA, TN Tech, TSTT, MTS millions of dollars. First of all, how is this being addressed? And furthermore, how does it or will it affect the operations at these state agencies? So, 
that is a very serious issue because they impact negatively on the cash flow situation in both utility company TNTech and WASA. So it is a fact that state agencies, the public sector and the private sector, the, the private businesses, they're owing both utility companies large sums of money. It is something that we, are, we continue to grapple with because if the state agencies do not have the requisite funding to, to operate and to move the operation, it will impact upon the delivery and the quality of service both in TNTech and WASA. So the Ministry of Public Utilities, we, we continue to reach out to state agencies, we continue to reach out to ministries, government departments, and we encourage them to pay their monthly bills to, to the both utility companies. And I, and I must say that we are seeing a more concerted effort on the part of the utility in, 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 on the part of the public sector to meet those monthly and quarterly requirements to pay water and electricity bills in order to allow the utility companies to operate. Now, Minister, within recent months, there were two major issues at your ministry. There was the island-wide blackout, and of course, there was the burst main in Kokorit. I mean, looking back on these two issues, in hindsight, did the utility companies do everything that they could have done to inform the public what was happening? And moving forward, what are some of the recommendations the ministry will give to these utility companies to get that information out to the public sooner? So, you know, when you look at things from hindsight, way after and long after the event, you know, you have time and opportunities to see, you know, what could have been done better. We worked collaboratively with the Ministry of Communication and a decision was taken that TNTech will be the lead agency to communicate with the public on what was taking place with the blackout on that event because TNTech and some of their senior officials were in contact with the IPPs on what was actually taking place and would have been better placed to disseminate and to communicate to the national population. As difficult as it was, it of course would be difficult to communicate with the public where you do not have access to electricity. So the main form of communication was social media and a number of our customers not having access to electricity. And in a number of instances, telephone communication was made very, very difficult. It was very difficult on the part of the utility company to spread its messaging across the island of Trinidad. However, they continue to disseminate the requisite information almost on an hourly basis. And some errors were made, as was pointed out in the, in the blackout report that I laid in the parliament. And those errors that were made, um, you know, they pointed to black start operation. How do you start off those machines that went completely out of operation. And what the, the report um, recommended was the fact that TNTech, working along with the independent power producers, ought to have a number of exercises where all of the professionals operating seamlessly must be familiar how to manage in a very difficult circumstance as that. But the report also pointed out that TNTech's um, electricity system and its infrastructure is very robust and the possibility of an island-wide blackout taking place again is very low. However, some key recommendations were made so that in the unlikely event of it happening again, it will be better managed with a state agency taking full responsibility to communicate with the national community like the ODPM. And I believe that, God forbid, should such event occur again, Learning from the experiences of this recent um, unfortunate incident, we will be better placed to manage a very difficult situation as that. And I want to give the assurance to the people of Trinidad and Tobago that every single recommendation that was made in that report, we will do everything to operationalize these recommendations because they are necessary, because we must learn from our mistakes and we must continue to make our electricity infrastructure more robust than what it is right now. And Minister, similarly, the uh, burst main that happened at, at, at Kokorit, I mean, there was gridlock traffic all over. I mean, yes. how can we improve the communication in that situation as well? And the problem again was, how do you coordinate the communication effort to inform the national community? Who takes charge at this point in time? 
What is the role of the, the, the TTPS? What is the role of the line ministry, the Ministry of Public Utilities? What is the role of the, the agency that is responsible for effecting the repairs? What is the role of the ODPM in such an instance? So in hindsight, I believe that um, WASA should have done a little bit better in communicating with the national population perhaps earlier on in the day before that gridlock took place. Because when they responded to that emergency the evening before, they encountered this high voltage um, electricity line, which delayed the, 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 the pace at which they expected to complete the repairs. But they had, we had an, another option, which was to disconnect the electricity supply in that entire western peninsula to allow Wasser to complete the repairs in the, in the quickest time. So we had to weigh what was better. And a decision was taken that if we were to discontinue the electricity, the electricity supply in the entire western peninsula, the impact on customers would be far greater than the traffic that they had to endure. As unfortunate as it was, we believed that the population would have been better served by going through the unfortunate occurrence of traffic gridlock as opposed to not having access to water and electricity, which would have caused more mayhem and inconvenience to the population, especially in Western Trinidad. But perhaps if we had communicated with the national population in advance, the necessary preparation would have taken place to reduce the level of inconvenience that the population suffered on that occasion. And that is what we learned coming out of this unfortunate incident of that traffic gridlock. And I intend, as we move forward, to monitor the way in which we manage some of these crises, to monitor the way in which we manage some of the interventions that we have to make um, when you respond to emergencies, to coordinate all the, the, the agencies of government and to keep the public informed. And by so doing, it will indeed reduce the impact on the people uh, and, and the customers. Now, Mr. Gonzalez, there are some state agencies we don't hear anything about, for example, MTS or Swim Call. Can you provide us with an update about what's taking place at those state agencies? Well, in Trinidad and Tobago, when you don't hear about at agencies, it's because things are working very well. Because we always tend to um, highlight when things are not working well, and that's the reason why WASA apparently is one of the most popular state agencies under the Ministry of Public Utilities. But insofar as it relates to Swim Call, we are doing quite a lot of work in Swim Call as it relates to the management of our solid waste in Trinidad and Tobago. And very soon, we will be talking about the establishment of our engineered landfill system, which we intend to start construction over the next two years. And um, the successful completion of that sanitary engineered landfill in the Forest Park area in, in, in South Trinidad, that will result in the decommissioning of the Guanapo Forest Park and Beetham Landfill. This is something that I'm looking forward to because you would have seen recently the impact of landfill fires and how it reduced the air quality, especially in, in Port of Spain. We are also looking to launch our beverage container bill and our integrated waste management policy for Trinidad and Tobago. And um, so I'm, I'm anxiously looking forward to the completion of these projects in, in this current financial year. As it relates to MTS, MTS continues to provide strategic um, support for the Ministry of Education and some other government agencies in project management services, security services, janitorial services. And MTS continues to do quite well despite um, operating in very difficult economic circumstances because of the prudent management of its um, CEO and the board of directors. MTS was able to navigate through a very difficult economic time. And, um, and I look forward to, to the company continuing to provide that strategic support to those other ministries that it is providing um, project management services in the construction sector. In TT Post, we are doing quite a lot quietly. I can boast and I can say that TT Post, for the very first time, has far exceeded the Universal Postal Corporation standards for its customers. And um, I am very happy and I'm very excited with the strategic plans, 
going into the future, we are looking to modernize the operation of TT Post, delving into the financial sector. They have completed their S42 standards, where we're going to introduce a postal code in Trinidad and Tobago, which will see an improvement in the levels of service. They have also completed some major infrastructure work at Gasparillo in Tacarigua, and they are now looking to modernize the, the Diego Martin um, postal, postal office. So TT Post is doing quite a lot, and I'm looking forward to the company pursuing other initiatives to improve the levels of service to its customers, and especially where um, courier services um, delivery um, is concerned. All right, with respect to the Met Office, the Met Office plays a very vital role in communicating to the people of Trinidad and Tobago on weather conditions, especially as we approach the hurricane season. We depend on accurate predictions of our weather conditions, of development, um, developments taking place in the Atlantic Ocean, so that the people of Trinidad and Tobago, as well as the Caribbean, can adequately pr um, prepare for difficult um, weather conditions that may come our way. And in so doing, to improve its services and to improve the projections and the delivery of timely and accurate information to the people of Trinidad and Tobago and the Eastern Caribbean, we are looking to acquire a modern GO-16 satellite system, which we, which we intend to deploy before the end of this financial year. And this GO-16 satellite um, radar system would be able to allow the MET services to predict what is actually taking place and to disseminate information in real time so that the people of Trinidad and Tobago can take appropriate action, be it floods, heavy rains, hurricanes, and other extreme weather conditions so that we can take appropriate action to protect ourselves, we can plan our lives. So the strengthening of the services of the Met um, Services Division in, under the Ministry of Public Utilities is well under our focus. It is in alignment with government um, strategic plans for economic development, for national development, and I continue to work with them so that they can improve their services to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. Now, Minister, we have come to the end of the program, but before I let you go, any closing thoughts? Yes. Um, the utility sector in Trinidad and Tobago is at a serious crossroads. We have to look at our operations and we have to prepare this country to have a robust utility service for the next 20 years, be it water, electricity, postal services, etc. But we, are, we have recognized that there are vulnerable groups vulnerable citizens who cannot afford water, electricity services, etc. And under the Ministry of Public Utilities, we continue to pursue our social programs to integrate some of our vulnerable citizens to ensure that they have access to water and electricity. So we would have spent over the last five years over $40 million in the utility assistance program, paying the bills of customers who cannot pay their electricity bills who cannot pay their water bills. There are a number of customers who cannot rewire their homes or their homes are in such a state that it can pose an electrical risk to their families. We are providing grants for those homes to be rewired. A number of those um, recipients of the grants would have received their, their grants last week. And we intend to, to continue to roll out these assistance to some of our vulnerable groups. There are many communities that are outside of the electrical grid, the electricity grid. What are we doing? We continue to spend millions of dollars to extend electricity services on a number of communities that do not have access to electricity. We have approximately 95% of our population having access to electricity services, but there are a number of other communities that don't, and we continue to put our focus to integrate and to bring those communities into get, getting their water, getting electricity, getting their postal services, and we would have spent over 60 to 70 million dollars trying to improve utility services to the people of Trinidad and Tobago. So why is we continue to pursue and initiate and to roll out huge capital projects, we are taking care of the vulnerable groups in the society who cannot afford it, and we are providing that assistance to them to ensure that they move along with us to getting access to utility services in Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you, Minister Gonzalez, for joining us on this episode of Delving Deeper. Be sure to join us on this station at the same time next week for another episode of Delving Deeper. 
I am Kimberly D'Souza, and on behalf of our crew, have a good night.